In December 2014, Peter Jackson completed a feat which seemed unthinkable as recently as the 1990s. When the closing credits rolled at the end of The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, Jackson and his production team completed the monumental task of bringing J.R.R. Tolkien's fantasy epics, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, to life on screen over a 13-year period. The films have all undoubtedly been a commercial success, grossing billions of dollars worldwide, with the full complement of six films finding themselves within the top 40 rankings of all time in terms of box office takings. Through the success of the two trilogies, Jackson has established himself as a leading director, and the profiles of actors such as Elijah Wood, Sean Astin and Andy Serkis have been raised significantly. However, the production of the six films and the journey of bringing such well-regarded literature to the big screen caused significant protest from within the Tolkien family, but also brought pressure from millions of expectant fans. Jackson was under great pressure to assemble a prestigious production team in order to do Tolkien's respected works cinematic justice. One of the greatest decisions he had to make was choosing who would represent Tolkien's world musically. Jackson chose the Canadian composer Howard Shaw to underscore his six films, and Shaw's music has been received with critical acclaim for both trilogies. This video will focus on two key discussions. Firstly, we will examine how Shaw represents the lands, regions and landscapes of a fantasy world musically, and secondly, in a fantasy world rich with unusual characters, races and names, we'll discover how Shaw assists the audience in associating with this fantasy world. The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit are set in the fictional world of Middle-earth, an imaginative and complex continent devised by J.R.R. Tolkien. Both trilogies follow, primarily, the journey of two hobbits, Bilbo Baggins and his nephew Frodo Baggins. In The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins accompanies 13 dwarves on a quest to take back their homeland, Erebor, or the Lonely Mountain, from the dragon Smaug, who sits upon its wealth of treasure. On their journey to Erebor, Bilbo Baggins finds the One Ring in the goblin tunnels of the Misty Mountains. This ring is the Dark Lord Sauron's long-lost ultimate weapon, which, if reclaimed by him, would enable his rise to power and subsequent rule of Middle-earth. In The Lord of the Rings, the ring is passed on to Frodo, who, with the help of eight companions, must journey deep into Sauron's evil land of Mordor and cast it into the lava of Mount Doom, a vast volcano where the ring was originally forged and the only place in Middle-earth where it can be destroyed. It is landscapes which will be approached in the opening section of this video. When composers write music set on Earth, the musical accompaniments for locations are often conceived with relative ease. Of course, these may contain a certain amount of cliché or even stereotype, but the clear association is made between music and visual. For example, an audience hearing bagpipes and seeing mountains may immediately think of Scotland, and a vast rolling desert accompanied by a didgeridoo would evoke Australia, even without the visual specifically outlining the location. This almost instantaneous recognition in establishing shots is vital for filmmakers. The director does not want to spend a large amount of screen time explaining the location to the audience. The narrative is the key. The case may be different for a fantasy world, however, so how does Middle-earth achieve this instantaneous recognition through music? We might ask how we locate ourselves in a fantasy world when we may be totally unaware of the lay of the land, and for those unfamiliar with the books, we may examine how music helps to establish the nature of these locations. Unless we take a map of Middle-earth into the cinema with us, it's crucial that Jackson and Shaw make abundantly clear the characteristics of each new location on screen, to help us associate with both the location itself, but also its respective inhabitants. The first significant location we see in the 2001 release The Lord of the Rings The Fellowship of the Ring is the Shire, home of Bilbo and Frodo Baggins, and the rest of the hobbits on Middle-earth. The music used to represent the Shire is perhaps the most well-known from the six films. The tin whistle is used to evoke a certain Celtic atmosphere, and it's not unreasonable to make the strong link between the Shire and the United Kingdom, particularly the countryside in the Midlands and Southern England where Tolkien grew up. What is unique about this motif is that while starting out as a piece of music to represent a location, 
it transforms throughout the films into something which has a far deeper meaning. The melody remains the same, but a grander hymn-like setting emerges which begins to denote a homesickness, but also a resilience of the hobbits on their journey. One example of this is when Frodo Baggins and his acquaintance Samwise Gamgee have left the borders of the Shire. The same melody is heard, but it's now in strings and French horn, as well as the original tin whistle, and it accompanies a tender moment of reminiscing, but also represents the character building of the two hobbits as they explore a new world. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. Come on, Sam. One of the challenges composers face when writing music for a fantasy film, as highlighted at the beginning of this video, is how to ensure the audience associates with the locations and characters across all of the films. The music must act as an audio anchor point to grasp the attention of the audience. Even if some audience members may not remember all of the exotic names of Middle Earth, the music can at least provoke a recognition of location. In 2012, the first Hobbit film was released, An Unexpected Journey. This film, like The Fellowship of the Ring, opens in the Shire, and the same musical theme is heard that first gripped audiences 11 years previously. Howard Shaw forges strong links between not only the Hobbits themselves and the music, but also the Hobbits' homeland and the courage, loyalty and companionship of the Hobbits. It's noteworthy that almost every time the musical theme appears, Bilbo or Frodo are talking about home or their own personal journeys. If the Shire represents a very English landscape, then we may consider, as an opposing case study, those races who live in more exotic locations. The Shire, it could be argued, is easily associated with, especially for those with a Western musical ear, who might recognise the inherent Englishness. The elves in their valley home of Rivendell presented Shaw with a challenge. He must have considered how he would attempt an underscoring of a location which is described in the book as being inconceivably beautiful, exotic and otherworldly. Shaw creates this exoticism through the use of harmonies which have a somewhat eastern feel, with ethereal female voices accompanying swelling string arpeggios and chimes. Welcome to Rivendell, Frodo Baggins. Doug Adams describes the Rivendell motif as containing a wonderful tone of opulence and stating that it's welcoming, open and gives a sense of age. The final example of how Shaw assists the audience in grasping the magnitude of Middle Earth is the use of what will be coined landscape montages. In each of the films there is one moment where there is no dialogue, no close-up characters in the shot but a soaring panning sweep across the Middle Earth landscape. These landscape montages not only help us to embrace the grandeur of Middle Earth, but also provide Shaw with a rare opportunity to dominate the film aesthetic. It's rare that music takes a real foregrounded position in Hollywood cinema, but in these landscape montages he has the opportunity to do so. Film music has many functions, but the montage function is used, as well as highlighting the landscapes of Middle Earth, to create the illusion that significant time or distance has passed. It's a clever use of cinematography by Jackson, who can progress the narrative while also highlighting some of the spectacular New Zealand-based Middle Earth landscapes in which the trilogies are set. The final point in today's video will be to look at some of the music to denote an evil character or object and in particular how an ever so simple passage of music can instantly come to denote terror and fear within an audience. 
The descending third motif denotes anything from Sauron himself, who is yet to take physical form even by the end of the trilogies, to his nine Ringwraith followers who seek nothing but the ring and pursue Frodo to the very end of his quest. The motif also signifies the land of Mordor. It first appears in the Lord of the Rings series and is often complemented with a terrifying harsh brass melody. The descending third motif forges yet another strong link between the two trilogies. When Gandalf first meets Sauron during the second Hobbit film, we hear the same ominous pounding descending passage. In the Hobbit films, we have a new antagonist as well as Smaug the Dragon. The large orc Azog pursues Bilbo and his dwarvish company, seeking revenge on their leader Thorin Oakenshield. Notice how the same descending motif is used to depict the enemy, but is slightly altered by a falling semitone at the end to create a new variation. Well, While we haven't even touched the surface in this video on the complexity of Shaw's music for the five films, we have discovered the importance of a compelling musical theme or leitmotif to draw the audience into the fantasy world in which Tolkien and then Jackson have created for us. Leitmotifs or musical themes are important in any film as they assist the audience in associating with characters, locations or objects, but I would argue that they are of paramount importance in genres such as fantasy and science fiction. You only have to look at Star Wars and John Williams' music to realise that it is an established and effective technique in film scoring. So to conclude with the question set at the beginning of this video, how does Shaw represent the regions and landscapes of Middle-earth through music? Well, I would argue that a grounding in European and British Celtic traditions for the Shire enables an almost immediate association and recognition in a Western audience that the Shire is somewhere homely, welcoming, where comfort is to be found. I would argue that the use of exotic Eastern musical harmonies and textures enable Rivendell to be perceived as otherworldly and mysterious to the travellers. And finally, I would reinforce the use of the landscape montage as an effective method of bringing as much of Tolkien's world to life on screen as possible. The grand orchestral panoramas we saw may not explicitly label the locations, but they help us to grasp the magnitude of Middle-earth and the scale of the quests in which our protagonists are set upon. There is great scope for the composer to enjoy the musical painting of the landscapes in fantasy and science fiction, compared with a film set in New York City, for example. In many ways, the Tolkien narratives are a set of fantasy road trip movies, if we use a modern analogy, and the music takes us on a journey but also points out useful locations along the way. Secondly, we asked how the music helps us to associate with characters. Well, likewise, the Shire theme with its soulful and nostalgic tin whistle melody and the variations which follow encourages an empathetic relationship with the Hobbits. When we hear the music, we think of the Shire or their longing for their homeland. It's a highly romanticised concept, and in a score and story which has drawn on comparisons to Wagner's Ring Cycle, it seems apt that the romantic notion of Sehnsucht or longing is evident in the score. Again, like in Star Wars, we have a simple but recognisable musical theme for the bad guys. Like the Imperial March in Star Wars for Darth Vader, the descending third motif fills the audience with the same dread. It's a dark contrast to the jollity and bucolic nature of the Tin Whistle, and helps to complete a magnificent musical patchwork of light motifs, which is continuously guiding the audience through Tolkien's wonderfully imaginative world. <laughs>